Welcome to Operation Odysseus, a naval history collaboration spanning 17 channels. Check the playlist in the description or stick around to the end to learn more. I've got a question. Why on earth does Venice exist? Seriously, the thought of a 1,300-year-old city built in the middle of a lagoon, sitting on nothing but piles of wood, yet covered front to back in marble makes absolutely zero sense at face value. Nowadays, we can justifiably worry about what rising sea levels and over-tourism will do to this grand architectural anomaly, but it's arguably a miracle that the city survived this long and even came to be in the first place. The Republic of Venice lasted from the 8th to the 19th century, surrounded by seemingly endless war, yet it maintained one stable and independent government for that entire run. To answer my rhetorical question and find out how this beautifully impossible city ever happened, let's do some history. In the centuries after the fall of Rome, Italy was somewhat of a no-man's land, changing hands between the Gothic kingdoms, the Byzantine Empire, and the Lombards. Around 600, the situation looked grim enough to convince the residents of Aquileia, Padua, and a few other surrounding cities to book it out of town and head for safer ground. Which is to say, not ground. Which is then to say, um water. These refugees joined with local fishing villages to build up shelter on some of the islands in the Venetian lagoon. This turned out to be a winning strategy because the Lombards were about as good at sailing as every other tribe of landlocked nomadic raiders. And beyond the Lombards, those few short miles between Venice and the shore proved the difference between safety and certain subjugation for 12 centuries. While the rest of the world was faffing about with walls like a bunch of dumb, boring idiots, Venice was sitting pretty behind its impenetrable megamote. Walls. Yeah, right. These settlers had to do a lot more than just not get conquered, and the early history of Venice was pretty labor-intensive. Since the marshy tide of the saltwater lagoon regularly rose and dipped, the Venetians needed something more stable to build on. So they drove long wooden pilings deep into the swampy ground before leveling it off and covering it. Rather than rotting, the waterlogged wood actually petrified, turning it into a solid foundation of stone. Over the centuries, citizens built the islands of Venice from literally the ground up. They also had to sort out a government. For its first century and a half, Venice was still officially part of the Byzantine Empire, but practically speaking, they were pretty autonomous under their imperial parents. It was at the turn of the 8th century when the Byzantines signed off on Venice forming an independent republic. The first doge, or duke, that we can be sure of is Orso Ipato in 726, and he was unique among European rulers since he was elected. The doge was then overseen by tribunes with veto power, and assisted by an assembly of noble citizenry and several small councils to help with legislation and administration. For a medieval government, this amount of civic engagement, not to mention thorough checks and balances, is nothing short of jaw-dropping. But much like Venetian geography, the government was also born of necessity. See, being smack in the middle of two giant empires, Venice could either look to the Byzantines, towards the Franks, or stay neutral. And these three factions did everything they could to stop the other two from gaining an upper hand. The result was an inconceivably well-balanced government that ruled with almost no hiccups for over 1,000 years. This legendary stability earned Venice its famous nickname La Serenissima, the most serene. The early growth of Venice is a slow burn, but the subplot of their uncertain alliances came to a head when Doge Obelerio more or less invited Charlemagne's son Pepin to just casually conquer Venice. Needless to say, this did not go over well with the locals at all, and after giving the Franks and Obelerio a firm kick in the ass and a hearty get out of my swamp, the new Doge, Agnello Participazio, asserted Venetian independence. He also directed a lot more public construction, because a maritime paradise won't just fabricate itself. And with that, Agnello and friends set the stage for Venice's rise through the Middle Ages, wherein they took the idea of naval trade and dialed it up to 11 million. But first, they needed to up their street cred so that people would trade with them and not the other cities in and around northern Italy. And there's no better way to become a badass than to pull off a heist. So, some Venetian merchants strolled down to the Muslim-governed city of Alexandria and discreetly carted off the body of Saint Mark the Evangelist to bring him back to Venice as their new patron saint. And to make sure that nobody caught wind, the Venetians supposedly hid his body inside of a shipment of pork so that the Muslim customs guards would and check it. And if you ask me, it's a damn tragedy that we praise the Trojan horse while sleeping on the unrivaled tactical brilliance that is the Venetian ham. Come on, people. It's the biggest Catholic meme this side of Pope fights. But anyway, with Mark now in Venice and corresponding lion imagery popping up in all directions, let's talk trade. And once again, the key to this whole deal was geography. Being nestled up in the eastern armpit of Italy, Venice had a straight shot to inland European markets, as well as easy access to eastern resources like silver and spices via their old friends, the Byzantines. And to keep everything secure, Venice pursued the Adriatic Sea through a strict policy of this is all mine now, colonizing islands on the Dalmatian coast to gather resources, service trade outposts, and put a dent in local piracy. Throughout the late Middle Ages, 
Ages, the entire Adriatic served as a runway for the Venetian navy, and with time it only grew as Venice developed an extensive network of coastal and island territories as part of its Stato da Mar, or State of the Sea. That right there is some lean empire building. We're talking 100% USDA prime mercantile muscle. And one of the reasons it worked so well was due to their willingness to trade with everybody, and I mean everybody. Even during the first few crusades, Venice was enthusiastically cutting deals with the various Muslim sultanates in Egypt and the Levant when no one else would. So with a little pinch of religious tolerance, they became fabulously rich. This is a great example of the Venetian mindset. In politics, trade, and culture, Venice struck a balance between giddy opportunism and ruthless pragmatism. It's almost insulting to the rest of history how efficient they were. The Signoria governed every aspect of maritime trade, from routes and crews to ship construction and cargo, but that council was run by the merchants, so everyone was working together to make it happen. Additionally, the state treasury itself acted as a bank, providing loans and even commerce insurance to support merchants, as well as publicly funding the construction of ships in the Arsenale, which, fun fact, developed mass production techniques that went unmatched until the Industrial Revolution centuries later. The Arsenale could turn out one full ship in a day. The adjective of Venetian was practically a synonym for for efficiency in the late Middle Ages. But let's hold the economics to get back to the saily stabby stuff. After centuries of peaceful cooperation, the Byzantines got fed up with the Venetians hogging their ports, doing most of the trade while paying none of the taxes. Deteriorating relations and a few riots in Constantinople came to a head in 1204, with the Fourth Crusade. Basically, what had happened was, the Pope wanted to retake Jerusalem, as you do, but the Crusaders didn't have any ships to get there. Venice kindly offered to provide on the condition that they take a pit stop in Constantinople to complete a side quest by reinstating a deposed Byzantine prince. Easy money, said the combined forces of all Europe. But then, after a few months, when the prince got deposed again and subsequently did not have their easy money after all, Europeans were miffed and Venetians smelled blood. What followed was, uh, a bad time for the Byzantines. The combined armies of Europe rampaged through Constantinople, looting and pillaging, but mostly just destroying and burning things over the course of three brutal days. The Venetians were slightly more scrupulous than their peers, and had the good manners to only steal the precious centuries-old Byzantine works of art. For instance, the famous horses of St. Mark, which, unsurprisingly, were not called that before Venice took them. As far as Europe was concerned, Byzantine territory was now fair game for annexation, and Venice promptly ignored the mainlands to gobble up the Aegean Sea. I've seen this episode referred to as the shameful glory, and I think that's really the best way to read it. Great for Venetian pocketbooks in the short term, but overall a deeply terrible thing to do, especially to your parent state. Bad Venice. Bad. Over the next several decades, the true enormity of Byzantine wealth became apparent, as Venice flooded with relics, books, artworks, and piles upon piles of coins. Throughout their history, Venetians had a reputation for going hard at lavish parties, and this did absolutely nothing to hinder that trajectory. They were the textbook definition of work hard, play hard. That's not to say that Venice never had bad luck, and the 13th and 14th centuries saw other powers try for a shot at the big Byzantine pie. Most notably, the Republic of Genoa across the peninsula arose as the biggest contender to Venetian maritime supremacy. But Genoa is a place that isn't Venice, so I'm kind of flying blind here, which means it's time to call in the cavalry. Ha! Take that, Thanos. Hiya, Sweeney. Welcome to the channel. Hey, Blue. Great to be here. Quick question. Where is here exactly? This is the magical world of line art, my friend. The background kind of comes and goes. Whoa, arms. That's new. Anyway, yes, I am here to talk about the other Italian maritime republics. You do know that there was other stuff happening in the medieval period besides Venice, right? I mean, people have told me that, yeah, but I didn't think they were serious. Yikes. Well, settle in, because we're going to talk about the history of Genoa. Genoa was, geographically speaking, Venice's almost exact opposite. On the other end of the Italian peninsula, and like Venice, she shared in the benefits of having her markets close to the European mainland. Obviating the need for messy overland trade, which cost a heck of a lot more to accomplish, and was widely less successful due to warfare and bandits. On water, Genoa could police her own trade routes, protecting her cargo from pirates and other rivals without the need to pay mercenaries, because, just like Venice, they were stupid good at shipbuilding. That all being said, where exactly did Genoa come from? Well, hopping back to the wars between the Lombards and the Byzantines, they started emerging a pattern of maritime cities often neglected while whoever controlled them was fighting wars in Italy. Like most other Italian urban areas, Genoa gained a significant amount of autonomy as a city-state, carrying over older Roman Republican-style government even when the city was ruled by foreign powers. But through trade, the maritime republics flourished, building high walls to protect their cities and large navies to protect their merchant fleets. Venezia, Ragusa, Ancona, Amalfi, Gaeta, and Napoli 
or gained autonomy from the Byzantines, but Pisa and Genova, on the other hand, gained theirs from the Holy Roman Empire, since the Frankish conquest of the Lombards in the 8th century. Just as Venice dominated the Eastern Republics and set up colonies in the Mediterranean Basin, Genoa too defeated her rival Pisa, and began sprinkling her own trade outposts all over the place, most notably during the Crusades. Genoa and Venice would fight four separate wars for dominance over the Mediterranean, and in the Fourth War Genoa very nearly captured Venice itself, but which ultimately led to a Mexican standoff and both sides sued for peace. These wars absolutely exhausted both sides, and Genoa was never able to fully recover like Venice was, and soon became increasingly under the thumb of the expanding Kingdom of France. And that is just a brief overview of Genoese history. Thanks for having me on the channel, Blue. But wait, there's more! Ah, as a matter of fact, yes. You can click the link on screen to check out my video all about the Maritime Republics of Medieval Italy. Thanks, Sweeney. With Genoa addressed, let's return back to my happy place, where Venice proceeds to dominate the 1400s as the single greatest mercantile superpower on Earth! Ha 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 ha! Uh, Exhibit A, the Renaissance. Ah, good times. While most of Italy, even artsy pants Florence, was in a near constant state of war, Venice had a comparatively peaceful century, as it maintained its overseas holdings and stretched out onto the Italian mainland for the first time, picking up nearby cities like Verona and Padua without a fight. With a few notable exceptions, Venice was able to maintain that terra firma for the next few centuries, and all that trade money shows because hot damn those cities are gorgeous. Speaking of, I should probably talk about the city of Venice itself, since it's about here when it really came into its own. After hundreds of years of construction from basically nothing, Venice grew to over 100 islands. And as buildings were periodically replaced and restored, it developed a uniquely gorgeous combination of architectural styles. From Byzantine roots to experimentation with modified Gothic design and the development of Palladian neoclassicism to the adoption of Baroque, there's a staggering amount of scope and depth in Venetian architecture over time. And that's all on top of the streets being rivers. I could go on for a very long time, but this video is already pulling quadruple duty, so let's keep it moving. Renaissance, good time, art, great, but problem. After the Ottomans conquered Constantinople and started setting the terms of eastward trade, they got increasingly territorial with Venice, pushing them out of the Aegean and being harsher on trade agreements. Oh my god, it's almost like the Fourth Crusade had long-term consequences! Gasp! Anyway, even worse, Venice had to take up arms against the King of France and the Pope during the Italian Wars, but that is a mess of a story and it'll get its own video eventually. For now, safe to say those mainland holdings did come with some drawbacks. And finally, the worst news came from India by way of Portugal, when those wily Iberians found a direct sea route to Europe's favorite spice markets, circumventing Venice. Those are all well and terrible, but the biggest and longest lasting subplot here is the conflict with the Ottomans. The 16th century saw siege after siege as the Aegean Islands dropped like dominoes. The big exception came at the Battle of Lepanto, where Spain and the Italians united, for once, against the Ottomans, thrashing their navy and stopping their westward expansion. They really made it look easy, if only they could have done that the other 20 times the Ottomans invaded. Eh well, Venice still held on to Crete, or Candia as it was called, through the mid-1600s, and it was a pretty cool place. After Constantinople fell to the Ottomans, Candia became a haven for Greek artists and scholars, and remained a bastion of Hellenic culture for two centuries. Until the Ottomans took that one, too. So, in these last two centuries, Venice was staying afloat. They no longer had the best navy, nor the entire Mediterranean in their pocket like they used to, and with trade pivoting towards the Atlantic, Venice just couldn't keep up their spot as a maritime superpower anymore. They were still independent, because lest we forget that city was untouchable, they were still having a grand old time with Carnevale every year, and because of their policy of neutrality, they were still friendly towards just about everyone. In the 16 and 1700s, Venice was without its military or economic power, but weirdly enough, because of all of these factors, the city became a nexus of international diplomacy and subsequently a hub of political espionage, which is badass. But also, its cultural significance throughout Europe had never been higher. During the Enlightenment, Venice had some of the best art, music, literature, and architecture you could find anywhere. Venice was the capital of beauty. And to think, all this started a thousand years beforehand in a swamp. And then the Republic survived forever and nothing went wrong the end. Now, oh, alright, I'll talk about Napoleon. Fine. In 1797, after wrapping up the French Revolution, he brought the Bonaparte over to Italy. After an uncharacteristically abysmal attempt at diplomacy by an increasingly frail government, Venice was unable to protect itself from France. So the Republic abolished itself and surrendered to Napoleon, consigning the millennium-old government to an ignominious death for the sake of preserving the city. 
And that's the story of La Serenissima Repubblica di Venezia. In the following century, Venice came into Austrian hands before finally uniting with the Kingdom of Italy by the latter 1800s. If you visit the city today, you can still experience the ever-present and undying pride for one of the most extraordinary states in history. But to answer my question from the start, how and why did Venice last? Beyond what I've said before, I think it's because the Republic effectively leveraged its many strengths, and because Venetians always worked as a team regardless of how bad things got. Always for the good of the Republic rather than their individual benefit. Across all of those centuries, the citizens were like an expanse of tiny islands joining together to become something greater than the sum of their parts. And honestly, who else but Venice could have a metaphor for their history built into the city itself? Special thanks to Sweeney for joining me on this episode. You can check out his video with this link above, and if you want to learn a whole lot more about naval history through the ages, then please check out this playlist for Operation Odysseus. It's a project that Griffin the Armchair Historian and I cooked up, with the help of 15, yes, 15 other wonderful channels that you can check out. Sweeney, myself, and History Time are all discussing the Middle Ages, but we've got stuff from the ancient and early modern periods, as well as the 19th century and the World Wars. This was a whole lot of fun for me to work on, so I really hope you enjoy it.